Welcome to the Holistic Health Podcast, beautiful humans. If a professional, polished, well-edited podcast is what you're after, then move right on. If, however, you love unfiltered banter, unedited bloopers, authentic heart sharing, and a very generous dash of holistic health education, then you're in the right place. Let's dive in, shall we? Hey guys, welcome back to the Holistic Health Podcast. Amy, hi, how are you? Good morning. I'm feeling fabulous today. How are you? I am feeling pretty bloody good too. Started my morning with a walk with my mom and a swim, which was lovely. And Mm. she's so funny. She was asking me, I sent her some recipes and at the bottom it had like a low FODMAP option and she had no idea what it was. She's like, what is a low f- fop mip? And I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> <laughs> nothing you need to worry about. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Mama bear. <laughs> oh, no. So I am doing well. I love starting my morning. Yeah. Walking and going for a swim. It's just so, so grounding. Mm -mm. I would have liked to have started my day like that. Today was a little bit more um, on the hop, let's say. (laughs) Um, But I I am am planning to go and have a dip afterwards and cool off in the creek down the road. So here's to getting out in nature and freshening up in in the water, right? Love that for us. Well, let's jump into today because we have a ginormous topic to get through. And Mm. one that I will do my best to keep you on track with because we both know that you have a lot to say about it and rightfully Mm. so. So Mm. I'm going to do my best to drive the conversation with some questions that I know I first had when I was learning about SIRS and that I also know that patients often come to you with and, and bring up as well. So I thought where we would start is first of all pointing people towards the last two episodes on mold. So we did a mold part one and mold part two, because I do actually think that that's relevant to hear, um, you know, at some point in time and really rounds out this conversation as well. And secondly, can you explain what SIRS stands for and what it is? Mm. So as we covered in part one and part two, of this conversation around the way mould or more specifically a water damage building can make you unwell, those symptoms apply to everyone across the board, really. But there is a subset of humans that have an immune setup that means their immune system functions differently when they're exposed to certain triggers. Now, SIRS itself, the acronym is spelled CIRS, and that stands for Chronic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. And the difference between, say, a disease and a syndrome is it is the characteristics are less well-defined. It's like a collection of symptoms. There are some biomarkers, but it hasn't been elucidated to the point where it's set in stone and these are the parameters. So even though this condition has been around for quite some time, in fact, was really first coined in the 80s, mid-80s, it still remains one of those um, functional medicine mysteries to a degree in that when you're piecing together all of these moving parts, it can just it can take a while if you don't know what you're looking for. So SIRS doesn't have to be specifically triggered by mold or a water damage building. It's actually an umbrella term um, that refers to the dysfunction in the immune system. So I might explain that bit just quickly first and Mm. then run through um, some of the other things that might cause SIRS because you might recognize if you're listening to this, the symptoms, but not have had exposure to a water damaged building and there might be another reason why you have this but in the most simplistic way and immunologists don't come at me I'm trying to keep this really basic for, for, <laughs> they will everybody. hunt you down <laughs> yeah yeah come on then come and at me on Instagram secretary um, IGA defenses better be in good tact <laughs> <laughs> immune joke, friends, immune joke. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, so if you think about your immune system, 
They're like an immunological army that's designed to protect you from anything that your body wouldn't want in it. And that just doesn't have to be microorganisms like viruses and bacteria and fungi and other pathogens, but also things like toxins and chemicals. And essentially, if you split your if you split your army into two, you would have the innate immune system, which is not specific. And then the adaptive immune system, which are a little more sophisticated, um, very highly specific, but because of the nature of their work, it comes online. They're like a second responder and the innate immune system is the first responder. Now, the innate immune system, of course, includes um, things like the integrity of your mucous membrane, so the health of the lining of your nose, throat, lungs, secretory IgA production, even things like your stomach acid, not specific, will pretty much destroy most microbes that you swallow. Um, whereas the adaptive immune system actually takes its time to identify the, you know, the unwanted visitor and then creates a remedy specifically for that to tag it as a Um, as an invader or, you know, a foreigner or an alien agent in the body and then triggers a system of responses to clear it out of the body. Now, naturally, um, whenever something threatens the body, the innate immune system will respond first and it responds violently. If you think about it like, you know, cowboys with guns who are just ready to fire at anything that sets them off. So they roll in super fast, they come in hot and all guns are blazing. And they trigger a lot of inflammation, which is part of the the way in which they communicate to the adaptive immune system or the other team to come and join them. And what can result from that, what does result from that is large amounts of inflammation and also tissue destruction. Now, in the context of most immune responses, that's meant to be self-limiting. As soon as the second responders come on the scene, they send the cowboys home and they narrow their attack to what's specifically going on. However, in SIRS, the innate immune system doesn't stop firing. And so the inflammation continues to grow, it continues to get worse, and it persists. It doesn't ever switch off. And so the tissue destruction, everything else that comes with that is the end result. The number one, the issue doesn't get resolved. The adaptive immune system doesn't show up or it doesn't know how to do its job. And therefore the innate immune system just has to keep firing to hold, you know, the problem at bay. Now, in the case of SIRS related to mold or a water damaged building, the trigger is biotoxins from mold. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second, but there are other things in the environment that can trigger this kind of response in genetically vulnerable people. So Lyme disease is probably one of the other ones that's most well known, Um, but things like breast implant illness is another one. We also see it with certain um, pathogens um, that are, you know, enter into the gut. So things like fisteria, Um, Other dinoflagellates, cyanobacteria, like with algal blooms, can cause um, these issues. And even things like um, chronic pockets of infection. So if you have a root canal, um, very often that can um, actually be a container for residual infection and chronic inflammation on more of a subclinical level, uh, but even implants of any kind. So we also know like mesh implants for hernia repairs or prolapsed organs can trigger this as well. So it's not just related to mold or water damage, but when it is, um, I want to point two things out. Number one, anyone can develop SIRS if they live in a water damaged building for long enough or if the infestation of microbes and toxicants is bad enough. So no one is immune from this kind of response. However, in those of us with a susceptible haplotype, And if you haven't heard the earlier um, podcast episodes, and in particular, the first chat I had with Nat about it, um, even earlier than that, I actually experienced this myself and discovered I have one of the vulnerable haplotypes. But the understanding of these vulnerable um, genetic inheritances is that our immune system is unable to tag the toxins that mold makes for clearance out of the body. And so we become chronically poisoned and our immune system is firing like mad to try and address the issue, um, except 
the tools that it's using can't. And so you end up chronically inflamed and chronically poisoned until you apply appropriate protocols to sort that out. And so someone with my genetic makeup gets much sicker, much quicker. So let's say in a family of four, only one of those people have a vulnerable haplotype and there's been a leak in the house. This is where it can get so tricky because the Mm. other members of the family might be like, well, I'm fine. So I don't think it's the house because it's not affecting me the same way. But our bioindividuality, as always, has to be taken into account. So, yeah, certainly for me, um, this was a rude shock, (laughs) Um, (laughs) particularly because ironically, the year before I got sick, I did a national tour where I actually lectured about SIRS like I had any idea what it was. And I tell you what, I'm sure clinicians who've been through their own health journey can also attest to this, but there's a very big difference between reading about symptoms on a page and imagining what that's like versus experiencing it and also the way that it shows up in your clinic as well. People don't always um, remember the symptoms that they have, or they might overlook some of them as not being relevant, or um, they might've just accepted them from a different cause, which is definitely what I did in the beginning when I started getting sick. So yeah, these symptoms, um, if you're relating to, you know, a good collection of them, I would start investigating whether or not you might have SIRS from any cause. Uh, but certainly, um, given the prevalence of water damaged buildings being roughly one and two here in Australia, there's a good chance it could be from mould as well. Yeah, I think that like all of that is such good points to make. And I, when you said about the um, innate and adaptive immune system to start with, I thought it's like, I think of it as me and my husband um, trying to build Ikea furniture. I'm the person and you might, someone might relate who's listening, who's like, I don't read the instructions. I just go in a bullet a gate and try and sort all the shit out and put it together. And then it's an absolute mess and nothing functions properly. And then my husband comes in after analyzing the situation, reading the instructions properly and goes, actually, I'm going to be specific in where I put all of this together. (laughs) And it all happens much better, even though it might take a bit longer for him to come on board Mm. and do it properly. So if anyone (laughs) builds IKEA furniture like me, you are the innate immune system. And we need sometimes we need you to just get in there because there is the odd occasion where it works out. Uh-huh. And then I do also think, you know, we need the adaptive immune system. So, and then the other thing I wanted to say to that is I really resonate with what you're saying around, um, you know, this sense of when you've experienced something yourself, you can prompt certain symptoms better in people. Like I think of this particularly in patients with endometriosis and being able to explain that from a lived experience as well, because, you know, when you felt it yourself, you can describe it in way in lots of different ways because not everyone will describe the same symptom in the same way. You might have different words to say the same thing. So I think that's, yeah, really helpful. And just on the, on when you said haplotype and genetic genetics and genes, et cetera. So can Mm. you just maybe take a step back and tell us what, what is a haplotype and, and how do people find this out? And is it as mm. is it a thing where if your mum has it or your brother has it, then you're going to have it? Or how does it exactly work? So when you're looking for this, it is um it's different too. So um, one of the first questions I get about this is, oh, I've done my DNA or I've done ancestry.com is the information in there. And it's actually looking at different information to that. So you're looking at your um, genetics when you're looking at that. And that's really fascinating. And you can learn a lot about that, um, especially if you're drilling down into um, polymorphisms and looking at um nucleotide variations however haplotype occurs within a gene and it's I guess it's a layer deeper if you like in terms of the blueprint for how your body works the playbook for how you respond to your environment Um, and so very often people um, 
are disappointed to learn that that isn't going to give them the information that they need and they actually have to do another another test. So the test is called HLA DQDR genetic studies. And you're looking at the DQ and DR genes for um, haplotypes in there, which is, I suppose, similar to a variation, but also slightly different. Now, HLA stands for, I'm just going to get nerdy for one second or more nerdy than usual. It will allow it. Proceed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Permission. <laughs> Permission to fly by. Um, so that stands for human leukocyte antigen. Now, everyone understands what the word human means. Leukocyte is just Latin for white cell. So white blood cell, meaning your immune cells and antigens. So antigen specific. So antigens are basically... Um, the word we use to describe something that would provoke an immune response. And, you know, that can even include like food antigens, right? Some people have violent reactions to peanuts or strawberries. So essentially the immune system recognizes something as an antigen, aka this is bad for the body, and then will mount an immune response to sort it out. In this case, these haplotypes do sort of the first part of the job. They storm in with the, you know, the IKEA, what do you call that little doodacky they all come with <laughs> oh yeah I don't even know see I don't even read the instructions to know what yeah, the tool's called that thing can you tell I'm like you when it comes to <laughs> <laughs> like screw the screw the instructions um and it comes in all guns blazing but then the backup never arrive and finish the job and so we get this chronic inflammation so there's multiple different haplotypes that can lend themselves to sensitivities some of them you might simply be uh, sensitive to mold toxins. Some might be a combination of mold and other biological toxins or biotoxins from other microbes. And ultimately, I think it's quite empowering information to have because a lot of people feel like when they get sick, it was bad luck mm. uh, or it was something that happened to them outside of their control. And of course, sometimes it is. Um, but Actually, far more often we might adopt that mindset, but the truth is we were exposed to something in the environment either unknowingly in the case of mold or even like consciously, like being on our phones all the time and exposing ourselves to wireless radiation, for instance, that has a consequence. So by learning that you're sensitive to something, um, it will allow you to make better decisions or at least more informed decisions about your environment and exposures. And maybe if you're feeling unwell, help you identify where those triggers might be coming from in your home or office. So you'll get a report. There's actually um, a really nice couple of online calculators um, that you can use. There's one from the website, myhousemakesmesick.com. And you go to the HLA calculator. And even though your test result will give you some information, a website like that will actually give you a deeper and more detailed report, as well as references. You can go and have a poke around too, if you want, um, I guess, a, a, a more comprehensive understanding of what your genetic lottery actually means. Now, of course, it has to be passed down in families, um, but lots of things can go into driving our immune response. So for someone who's in like really good health, um, they might take longer to become unwell than someone who isn't, which might, again, explain why some people get sicker quicker outside of genetic vulnerabilities. But Definitely worth doing, especially if you seem to be chronically inflamed and you're having some issues that no one can really explain. Um, this might be another place that you can look. And how do people order that test? Like, is it something that it, that can be accessed, paid like direct to consumer? Does it have to be through a doctor? If someone goes to their doctor, are they going to be poo pooed because it's not a mainstream kind of mm. test? Is it something they need to go specifically to a naturopath or functional medicine provider that, you know, that advertises that they specialize in this area? Like where can people start? Obviously having someone help them interpret the results is the optimal thing, but I know the question will always come up, you know, can I access it without doing that? Yeah, you can. So look, in an ideal world, you would get your clinician to run it for you and, you know, most functional medicine practitioners, because you're paying for it out of your own pocket, aren't going to say no. 
um, mm-hmm. unless they think you're really wasting your time and money. But um, ultimately, it should be pretty easy to access. Um, if you're going through a GP, um, it isn't something that they're likely to be able to order for you on Medicare anyway. And if they aren't familiar with why you test and what you do next, if you're positive, you know, they're not the best person to support and guide you if you get a result that's meaningful. So you could either see a functional medicine practitioner if you're not already seeing one. Um, Alternatively, you can order a lot of pathology online now. I'll have to actually have a look at those um, laboratories and make sure they've got them, but I'm pretty sure iMedical offers it. Um, There's about three labs here in Australia where you can order your own pathology and literally anything that a doctor would order and then some. Um, And look, if you're just curious, you don't want to necessarily engage a naturopath or an integrative GP um, for any reason, you know, to start with, you could order it and then engage them once you have the result for guidance after that. So yeah, I think knowledge is power, but I think once you know if you have something, finding someone who's an expert in that area is definitely the next step. Yeah. Yeah. And I know like when you were just speaking about that, I know ice screen in Australia do, and and maybe you can um, have a look at this, but um, HLA, they call it a HLA celiac typing and that yeah. covers um, HLA DQ2, DQ eight maybe dq7 i have to double check it i'm just trying to remember the Mm. specifics but i know that it can get quite complex and again that's why sometimes just going through a practitioner can be helpful um Mm. but i'll pop it in the um we'll we'll have a look and we'll pop whatever is relevant in the show notes for you guys Mm -hmm. yep um okay cool so that makes sense now actually since i've brought it up Um, because this is something that sometimes people will be aware of and get confused about. So, you know, when it comes to like celiac testing, often there's the celiac gene. And does that have any relationship to the same HLA DQs that we're talking about or DRs that we're talking about in this conversation? Or is that separate? Look, it actually does. So, what we call the celiac gene should arguably be called the angry and aggressive immune response gene (laughs) Um, because it's, you know, it, it essentially is known to drive chronic inflammation, which drives, you know, autoimmune conditions and inflammatory stuff. And um, we know the, the most obvious connection with that is celiac disease and gluten, but it's actually a lot broader and deeper than that. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, so how I used to get um, patients to be get ordering this test without charge was actually to get the celiac gene test done through their GP. But it has since been changed and they now have dropped some of the haplotype testing. And so you actually don't get the answers that you're looking for anymore when you simply order the celiac gene test. Um, I also found um, frustratingly that they would often actually get celiac serology done instead and then that would come back to me and they haven't had the celiac gene test done and, you know, having to navigate that um, was a bit laborious. It was just honestly easier just to pay for the right test up front. Mm. Um, Of course, it depends on the person's budget. I now also, you know, give them very specific instructions about how to ask for it and what to ask for specifically. Um, But it has gotten to a point where the pathology, um, yeah, framework has shifted for that and it doesn't give you everything you need to know. So Mm -hmm. disappointing, uh, but that's where we're at. Yeah. Good to know. Good to know. Okay. So that, that makes sense. And that, um, yeah, I guess gives people somewhere to, to start with. So beyond this, um, HLA, um, haplotype, um, situation, are there any other, um, tests, pathology markers that you find yourself running frequently to try and confirm whether SIRS may be at play in association with obviously looking at their history and their symptoms? Mm, there's quite a laundry list, actually. So rather than boring our listeners with the whole lot, I might just throw a few out there. Um, but the reason I do want to touch on it is because 
I think almost for every person who is on this journey has been through the experience of going to their doctor, having tests run, and then being told they can't find anything or worse, there's nothing mm-hmm. wrong with you, which is what happened to me, even though God. I was you know, on, I felt like I was on the verge of dying. Mm. Um, and what can be, you know, that can be incredibly distressing um, to hear. So just, I guess, one very small example of this is the two, I guess, common uh, markers that are tested for as far as inflammation goes in a standard blood screen are ESR and CRP. And they're not bad markers to look for. However, um, there are over 180 different inflammatory mediators in the body you could arguably test for. And if neither of those two are raised, that doesn't mean you're not inflamed. And yet that's what patients are being told. No, nope, no inflammation here. See, ESR is fine. CRP is fine. And there, there seems to be this, this like understanding of like, you know, I had a GP tell me I couldn't possibly have high C4A and have no, like an, a CRP that wasn't elevated. Mm. And it was like, well, literally here's the pathology. You explain to me how that's happening. So the inflammatory mediators that are most prevalent in mould illness or water damage building affected individuals are C4A, which is a, um, I guess, a subprotein of the complement system and complement is like an inflammatory protein. Um, Just as a side note, C3A is jacked up in Lyme. And so often a functional medicine practitioner will run both to see whether the patient has one or the other or both. And Mm -hmm. you really can't start a Lyme protocol until the mold and C4A is dropped. So it's important to know that because there's an order in which you have to treat um, in order to get results. Um, another one is transforming growth factor beta one. Um, this one can cause um, nerve damage. It also is responsible for the fibrosis that occurs in the lungs, which can create like an asthma like syndrome, um, independent of actual asthma, but like a breathlessness mm. um, because of um, poorer um, gas exchange across the membranes. Um, what's another one that I'm thinking of? Um, can't think of that right now, but let me go on to the other markers. So mm-hmm. typically in over 90% of SIRS patients, alpha MSH will be low. Yes. So it's quite rare to test that and get a result within range in someone that has SIRS. It does happen, but not very often. So, you know, if um, these things add up, I will say I had every test except MMP9. That's the other inflammatory one that just escaped me just then. And mm. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, all up, they cost about $2,000 out of pocket. And often when someone is this unwell, they're not working, they don't, typically don't have that money. And if you can make an educated call on what's going on, they're actually much better off spending that money on getting to a safe environment and starting treatment. But if you were only going to order a few, alpha MSH would be one that I definitely would order um, and C4A, maybe C3A. Um, and you can kind of piece enough bits of the puzzle together to go, okay, well, I think we're okay to treat this and we're not missing anything. But MMP9 is often elevated. Um, when we talk about symptoms, I'm going to refer just to, you know, how they relate to biomarkers. But one of the things that isn't on the list of symptoms that I've noticed in mold patients is um, receding gums. And MMP9 is a, an enzyme matrix metalloproteinase 9 that degrades connective tissue. And some of the other things people report are, I look old all of a sudden, or my skin's really loose and saggy, or I've got more wrinkles. Now, look, <laughs> if a patient's sitting there going, I've just accelerated and aging, like it's pretty hard from a you know an external point of view to go, well, that's a genuine symptom I should worry about, right? Mm-hmm. Like you could sort of, you could write that off as anything, but it actually is a sign of this increased MMP9 activity. But MMP9 is secreted in the saliva. And as a result, what I've noticed and that I experienced was receding gums as a result of that. And looking back, I also now know like 
um, when I was in the middle of that, if I chewed chewing gum, it would actually kind of break apart in my mouth. And it was the enzymes that were destroying that, um, that I didn't know were present at the time. So yeah, MMP9 is a good one. Other ones that um, you can test for that are not direct, not, not specific, but are ADH or antidiuretic hormone. Mm. There is, you know, the neurological inflammation that occurs um, as a result of mycotoxin exposure can cause shifts in all kinds of um, elements in the body, including temperature regulation issues, but also um, damage to the pituitary and therefore an issue with ADH um, secretion. And ADH basically regulates how much urine you produce, how um, much of water kidneys retain in your body. And when you lose ADH or you're not producing enough, you're basically urinating a lot more. There are obviously other conditions that that can cause that symptom too. But um, yeah, ADH and looking at urine osmolality is definitely another clue as to what's going on. Um, they're probably the main ones that I'll share. There are others that are specific and non-specific, but thankfully there's a laundry list that's already been elucidated. And I would probably match people's symptoms to the biomarkers we know are responsible um, in order to, if you're going to ha- you know, cherry pick what you're testing for to actually get a better hit rate on what's going on in their body. Mm. And thank you for sharing all of that. And hopefully everyone's brain's not exploding yet. Um, but <laughs> I, so I want to uh, ask a couple of more questions on that. So first things first, these different um, inflammatory mediator biomarkers um, and different, you know, MMP9, ADH, et cetera, are they, again, conversations that are worth having with a standard GP or are you going to just be banging your head up against a brick wall? And if so, where is the best place to go for this? Because, I, I mean, I would say first off the bat, going and doing this testing privately by yourself is probably just going to make you more confused and anxious than having someone help you through this because mm. as you've said and particularly when we I'll come I'll bring it back to talking about a syndrome when mm. you're talking about a syndrome I I really think that having someone look at your case individually is important because we're looking at really a collection of symptoms and as you've just said matching symptoms to pathology markers or biomarkers and then making informed conclusions from that. And that, A, is very hard to do if you don't have the experience in the specific area. And B, mm. is very hard to do if you are actually have a reason to be testing that, then chances are you're not feeling your best and to piece all the puzzle pieces together is, is very difficult. So I guess my question is, if people are listening to some of these podcasts and going, oh, shit, like I think maybe I, I'm, I'm starting to fit this cluster, these clusters of symptoms and these um, red flags of my my history and what's happened in the past for me or what's happening now. Is it a, is it a functional medicine doctor, integrative doctor conversation or a naturopathic conversation or both? Where do mm. people start? So this is probably the the most difficult part um, for a patient to navigate because um, I think it's important to inform if you have a family doctor or GP you see regularly to inform them and share the results. But um, if they haven't had specific training in this, they aren't going to know what to do next, even if they feel compelled to dig a little bit deeper. And Unfortunately, this is also quite a blind spot in naturopathic medicine. So it isn't as simple as just dialing up a naturopath and talking to them about it either. I wish it was. And, you know, my professional mission in this world is to ensure that, you know, by the time I die, it is just part of the curriculum of, you know, all natural health um, training. But at the moment, it's not. And that's why I didn't know about it either until it happened to me. So there are a few things you can do um, and a few questions you can ask and a few places to look to really um, shortcut finding someone who is good. Probably the best advice I could give you is to go to either the Facebook group Toxic Mold Support 
Australia and New Zealand. Um, they also have a website. I'm just going to have a quick look now. Um, I think it's toxicmold.org. And they actually have on there a list of clinicians, both, both natural health professionals and allopathic professionals who have either done the specific training you need to do, and I'll talk about what those things are in a minute, or are knowledgeable enough to navigate that for you and get you a result. Um, and that's based on not only the databases of the formal training that's available on this specific condition, but also feedback from mold sufferers in the group um, about things like bedside manner and, you know, all sorts of things and whether they follow a fully allopathic pharmaceutical protocol or, you know, fully naturopathic or you can get the best of both worlds um, out of that. Ideally, you'd find a functional medicine practitioner, maybe a naturopath who's trained in this, who has a good relationship with a GP that's integrative to a degree. And in case you need any of the pharmaceuticals, they can work together to manage your case. Um, but essentially for a long time, the, the training was provided by Dr. Richie Shoemaker in the US. And you can um, find his website and his database online. I'm pretty sure it's survivingmold.com. Yeah, it um, is. Bear in mind, it's mold spelt the American way without the U. So M-O-L-D, survivingmold.com. He's got a database of clinicians who um, have done his training. And he's sort of, I guess, the, the grandfather of all of this. Um, grandfather that being, Mold. What grandfather a, what Mold. A, what a fun guy. <laughs> Google pop. <laughs> I was really waiting for my opportunity with that, to be honest. Oh, Nat, honestly, you've missed your calling. Like if natural medicine doesn't work out for you, I'll see you at the stand-up bar. <laughs> okay, perfect. I cannot wait. You can do um, karaoke intermission for my shows oh, as well. Uh-huh. Halftime entertainment deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, look, he he's a, you can look for clinicians there, but um, for a long time he only offered training in person, and so we only had you know a handful of not even Dr. Sandeep Gupta, I think was the first doctor who actually did the training through Shoemaker, and you know he's booked out. However, he has supported many clinicians in learning, and so I, you know we now have a good dozen um, GPs in Australia who are mold aware and mold trained, certainly from an allopathic point of view. Um, from there though, there's another crowd called ISEA and they have, um, and that stands for International Society of Environmentally Acquired Illnesses. Um, and I think they've really furthered Shoemaker's work in a more holistic way. And so you can find allopathic clinicians there too, but they tend to have an even more holistic and rounded and natural approach. Really depends on, you know, what you value. But if you're listening to the Holistic Health Podcast, I'm pretty sure <laughs> that you value. You're not just here for the jokes. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, who knows? They're pretty good, Nat. Maybe they are. <laughs> but, Yeah. Pretty safe bet to say holistic approaches to your health are something that you appreciate. And so you can also look for a clinician on this site. Um, and just to blow my own trumpet for a moment, I also created a professional education training for clinicians back in 2020, actually, which feels like a lifetime ago, um, for a company called Bioceuticals. Now, how long that will remain available, I don't know. It's not something I support anymore. And it is something that I'm considering recreating for a different platform. Um, but anyone who's undergone those trainings, and I have to say the first round was like 40 practitioners. Um, so you can always reach out to Bioceuticals and ask them, can I have a contact who did that course in my area or someone who does telehealth? So thankfully, we're at a point now where awareness is spreading. I know certainly um, since I became unwell, I'll talk about this at any opportunity. So every lecture I have ever given since then on any subject, I've inserted mold into the conversation. Um, and it's, you know, it's reaching a point now where people are familiar with it, even if they don't fully get it just yet. Um, mm -hmm. So hopefully, you know, um, those times where a clinician kind of looks at you like you're nuts are going to fade away. Um, but for now, um, 
this is where you can find people who've got that understanding and the training um, to fast track your healing. Because what I hear very often is people wasting a lot of money on doctors and naturopaths who don't actually have the roadmap, who are doing their best. Um, but when you're this stressed and this sick and often very financially uh, impaired, you just don't have a day or a dollar to waste. Mm, yeah, I agree with that. And I and I think, you know, as, you know, a naturopath, a functional medicine, nutritionist, whatever it is, I think, you know, sometimes people can come and they present with lots of different symptoms and you implement some initial strategies and they start moving in the right direction and the waters get unmuddied a little bit. And then you're like, okay, cool. Like this is moving in the right, uh, right direction. But then there are those cases where it's not. And I think knowing, even if you don't know how to treat mold illness or SIRS or um, whatnot, knowing when to refer on to people that can or sh or you know will treat that and know that roadmap because I really think it's impossible as a naturopath or a funk or any practitioner to know how to treat everything. But mm -hmm. I think it's a really good idea to be skilled in how to pick up that maybe this is what's going on and then you know refer on or refer out um, as soon as you're kind of aware that actually this is I don't know how to take this person to that next stage and I don't think there's any shame in doing that at all I've mm. referred multiple mold patients to you mm. and some other practitioners at various times because I can pick it up in terms of um, yep I think this is probably an issue for you and and implement some initial strategies uh, if it's only a very mild uh, case, but then as soon as I'm like, oh no, this is a like there's a fair bit of this going on, I just go, no, no point holding on to people for ego's sake or you know wanting to fix them because you really want to be the one to help them get better. I think just knowing when to part like you know pass on compassionately is a really something that clients ad admire because. I mean, I respect that in someone if they're like, you know what, I've taken you as far as I can and know how to with my skill set and here's yeah. who to go to next. Yeah, 100%. Life is so precious. And as you say, it is impossible to know everything. Um, and, you know, a bit like you have sticking to your zone of genius makes it easier for everyone. And it's really just being about aware about that. And, and look, it's understandable that in the beginning it can be quite hard to discern mm. what exactly is going on. So no clinician's perfect. If you're listening to this and you've been frustrated by, you know, things that haven't worked, you know, our, our bodies don't really come with a, a manual and we're sort of building it as we fly the ship, I suppose. And sometimes, unfortunately, it is a bit of a process of elimination. It is a bit of try this and let's see what happens. But if things are still kicking around, you haven't landed on either the cause or the right remedy. And just knowing how geared the body is to healing, it, it's I tend to look like lean more towards the core. We haven't found the root cause here. So, yes, maybe we should run through the symptoms so people know what the heck we're talking yes, about. Yes, <laughs> I was just about to ask you because there is a, uh, a, a list of what, like 35 or something recognized symptoms. So maybe run through, I mean, as many as you want. And we'll also refer people to your ebook because it listen, it listens, it lists out these for people to look back on as well. But start wherever you like. If you want to mention all 35, then you do you. If not, maybe some of the most <laughs> common ones you see. Yeah, look, so I had 33 of these, okay, or all yep. of them but two. Um, but basically the, the criteria is if you download this book, you'll see they're bunched into groups, 13 different clusters. And the way Shoemaker, the protocol for identifying um, whether someone has this is if they've got a symptom from six clusters, um, it's likely that they have SIRS if they have a symptom from eight clusters. It's almost, you know, they do have it virtually, mm -hmm. and that's when you'll go through and do the testing. Um, if you've only got like two or three, you might still be being exposed to mold, but you might not have full-blown SIRS. So I'll run through just a few just because there are a lot. Um, but standing out on its own is fatigue. 
And one of the big causes of chronic fatigue syndrome is, well, chronic fatigue syndrome is caused by chronic inflammation because chronic inflammation damages mitochondria, which are the little engine rooms that produce our energy. So as soon as you don't produce enough energy, you're going to be tired. Um, Of course, other things can cause inflammation, but chronic fatigue is definitely one of those symptoms. So too is um, chronic pain. And what we found with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia is 90 to 93% of patients that fit either of those categories have definitely been exposed to mold. Um, So if you haven't got an answer yet for those things, I would be looking there. But in particular, joint pain and morning stiffness is quite characteristic. I know when I started getting sick, um, I'd get up in the morning and I felt like I was 90 and I would groan and moan getting out of bed. Like I would joke with my husband about my granny groans and, you know, you just never know how good or bad you're supposed to be feeling at the age that you're at. You're like, is this just what getting older feels like? Yeah. RIP me. Um, and I was <laughs> like, <laughs> wow, all right, this sucks. I'm like 37 and I feel like I'm 90. Um, mm. But also cramps. And this has to do with the loss of electrolytes. And it actually lends itself to general muscle tension, which is where the fibromyalgia stuff comes in, but literally cramps, you know, you'll jump out of bed with a calf muscle, you know, um, shortening itself or wherever you get cramps in your body. Now that sort of tends to show up a little bit later on once the diuresis or the loss of urine has been um, consistent and you've lost electrolytes um, over a period of time. Um, Headaches, um, a common, like anytime you've got a toxin on board, you know, the brain inflammation um, and the issues with circulation can cause a headache and the muscle tension, light sensitivity. So I actually don't remember having that when I was sick this time, but I do remember having it in the past. And I do wonder whether or not that was neurological inflammation from exposure that was less extreme. I would sort of, I would pirate eye in the morning, like, you know, when you Mm. sort of get up and the lights are on and you're like, you can't open your eyes properly. It's you sort of squint and there's like one that's looking where you're going, but light sensitivity. So if you're someone that always has to wear sunglasses because your eyes are so sensitive or you always have the lights down low and, you know, those things could indicate neurological inflammation of any source. Um, Neurological inflammation also affects how your brain functions. So um, for me, decreased assimilation of new knowledge, couldn't remember things. Um, It can also cause confusion. In fact, I developed full-blown dementia or inhalational Alzheimer's like to the point where I didn't know how to dress myself and I couldn't remember my name. I couldn't hold a conversation, um, which was pretty, pretty scary stuff. Um, also mood swings, um, brain inflammation will create anxiety, depression. I was always, um, prone to feelings of anxiousness and worry my whole life. Again, who knows, was that really me or was that on, you know, often on mold exposure, I'd, I'll never know, but I'd never experienced depression and certainly nor rage. And I would refer to it affectionately as mold rage. And my husband got this too, actually, um, even though he is not genetically susceptible. So he was quite flat mood wise and would feel like this, it's very interesting, this internal physiologically driven anger. There was nothing to be angry about, um, but we felt angry. Um, It was purely brain inflammation. Um, Feelings of weakness as well. Like not that I'm some kind of superwoman, but you know your strength, you know what kind of weights you can lift when you're working out, you know what kind of groceries you can carry, how far you can walk with them. And I just turned into a weakling where I just could barely do anything. I couldn't open jars. I couldn't carry heavy groceries. I couldn't blow dry my hair. So this was what, obviously, if you don't blow dry your hair, you're not going to get this kind of tell, but like I would be holding the hairdryer and it would be just felt so heavy. And within like 30 seconds, my arm would be so fatigued. I'd have to put it down. And I would actually, I couldn't style my hair, but I'd have to sort of lean over and put my elbows on the bench so I could rest my arm that had the hairdryer. Mm. So I could 
to get my hair dry because I didn't have the strength to hold it. And of course, I'd previously blow dried my hair thousands of times, no problem. So that was how weakness showed up for me. Other people might find, you know, carrying their kids feels a lot harder or impossible, or they notice that, you know, if they're a CrossFit person, all of a sudden the weights they can lift or the reps that they do just dramatically drop. And they're like, what is wrong with me? So that was really interesting. Um, the other thing that's not on this list is post-exertional malaise or feeling tired after exercise. And that was another really big sign for me where, you know, I've worked out my whole life, you know, not like a crazy gym bunny, but I move my body and sometimes I'll do more intense periods of training and sometimes I'm a little lazy, but I also know what I'm capable of doing. And I started, yeah, at this point as I was becoming unwell, I would be so exhausted after a workout and I wasn't doing anything outside of what I've ever done. I'd have to go back to bed and sleep for four hours. Um, Mm. So that was sort of the beginning of the decline for me. Um, The neurological inflammation, there's sort of other flavors of brain dysfunction. So issues with your memory, like I would, I forgot where I was sometimes. I forgot where I was going sometimes. I'd park my Vespa on the road leave the keys in the ignition. I forget to take those out, walk away, and then not remember where I parked, Um, but also decreased word finding. Now, every one of us has had a moment. I think I've had several in this episode where I've just gone, (laughs) what's that? What am I looking for? What word is that? But it happened all the time, and I couldn't Mm. even do basic maths. Now, in school, I did physics, chemistry, calculus. You know, I did... I wasn't a mathematician, you know, Sounds like you were. <laughs> like, I don't know, but you know, <laughs> I did algebra. <laughs> I remember doing algebra. <laughs> Trigonometry. Yeah. Or obtuse triangles, all of that good stuff. And I literally, I couldn't figure out change at the supermarket register. Like it was really like, where are my brain cells today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day. So those kinds of signs again should be you know, you might just be tired. Obviously a lack of sleep causes brain inflammation. It happens to the best of us now and then, but if you're, if you're just getting worse and worse and it's happening all the time, that says to me, something's going on to impact your brain function. Now I'd like to think I'm the poster child for recovery. I can now have a conversation, string a sentence together, remember things, uh, but it was pretty scary at the time. Difficulty concentrating was probably one of the first symptoms of brain dysfunction for me I'd sit down to do a day of work and I just was like I had ADD which of course has brain inflammation as part of its physiology Um, so that was tricky as well a few other things I experienced off this list shortness of breath like I again September 2016 so a few months before I moved into the apartment that was leaking I'd just done a 9k fun run now I hate running so fun run just is a bit of an oxymoron to me but like (laughs) you know it was you know the company I worked for puts on the Blackmores you know run and I thought I'll challenge myself to do more than the 4k you know faff around and um, I didn't run the whole way but mind you but like I walked and jogged and walked and jogged nine kilometers um Next minute, I couldn't walk 50 meters without like wheezing. Like I was an emphysema patient and it was like, well, this is weird. I don't smoke. Um, yeah. I was previously quite fit and this is just really bizarre. And even more strangely, I got screened for asthma and I, my breathing worsened after they gave me medication to improve my airway patency, which Mm. they were very weirded out about. (laughs) Um, But anyway, it just, I can, I can explain that to them now, but I couldn't at the time. Um, Excessive thirst, because you're not producing adequate amounts of antidiuretic hormone, the kidneys Mm. aren't retaining the amount of fluid and electrolytes you normally would. So you get thirsty, you pee a lot. And then when the electrolyte balance goes right out, you start getting, yeah, muscle cramps and also electric shocks. Now, static charges can build up, you know, at drier times of the year and depending on what fabrics you're wearing and the soles of your shoes. But when you have this, you're shocking yourself quite frequently. Um, And that's because of the sodium buildup on the skin. Appetite swings, temperature swings um, can be an issue as well. And a lot of gut stuff. Um, 
not constipation, but definitely food intolerances and diarrhea and abdominal pain. And interestingly, what I've seen um, in myself, I'm about to give everyone way too much information. So we're here for it. We're ready. (laughs) Brace yourselves. What I've found in myself and also in patients, both retrospectively and going forward, is loss of control of your bowels seems to be quite indicative of. I'm going to actually, I'm going to go there. Can I tell this story? I just love how eloquently you say it. So if I was to say it, I'd be like, people start shitting themselves and you're like, Uh, loss of control of your bowels. I'm like, noted, much better way to say this. Oh, so I'm just going to share something I've actually never shared publicly. Did you shit your pants? I did. I did. It's actually happened to me twice, but um, <laughs> like just a little squirt, like just a little, like a shot, or like we're talking. Oh no! Okay. <laughs> <Our emotions. laughs> oh god! Some people who aren't into like poo humor are really not going to enjoy this. But, um, I'm going there anyway. So the first time it happened to me was actually prior to me getting really unwell, but it was in an apartment block that I knew had a mold problem. Mm-hmm. And I was actually leaving for work, um, thankfully wearing black. <laughs> well, I was just about um, to say, what were you wearing? Yes. And this one, thankfully, was a very small explosion. And there was a toilet in cubicle in the garage where my car was. This is before I left for work, by the way. And I was sort of, it wasn't a big deal, but I did go up and have a quick shower and get changed. A little alarming though, right? Like it's not <laughs> something you expect. I feel like at the time I was like 32, 33, maybe 34. That was the period that I lived in that building for anyway and was having just a few issues. I didn't have the understanding that I have now, but I knew the mold in that building wasn't good and I knew it was impacting me somehow. You knew shitting yourself as an adult probably was a bit of a red flag. <laughs> probably a bit of a red flag, guys, a big red flag. Anyway, no, it gets worse. Let's let's go to the really bad one. Okay. So, uh, so the home that I was in <laughs> was in Manly. So for anyone who's not familiar with Sydney, it's on the northern beaches of Sydney, gorgeous place, beaches, the whole gamut. I just walked down. We lived on Darley Road on the hill um, of North Head. And so I was walking down to the Four Pines for a drink and dinner. And I was wearing very tight <laughs> black leather pants. And this was not, this was not, this is, this is not where I thought the podcast was going to go when we started. This. And you agreed to do a podcast with me. This oh is God, always where the podcast are. ends. I up. promise never to hold back or hold out on you. So we're going there. I literally, I shat myself, Matt. <laughs> and it was not a small, it was, it was the whole content. <laughs> whole freaking lot I actually have a photo I'm actually mortified to share this bit but like we're gonna sweat we're in now we're boots and all I was already I was already most of the way there and I was really hungry (laughs) I just went to the bathroom cleaned myself up as best as I could you couldn't smell it it wasn't gonna leak because those pants were skin tight and I just went to dinner (laughs) and then I I worried about it when I got home (laughs) Oh my god, that's so funny! Did you tell anyone at dinner? No, God, no. Okay, just a difference like, between you and me. <laughs> well, it wasn't just my husband. It was like we were meeting friends, and oh no. Anyway, this is the first time I've ever shared that with anyone. So, oh my god, were they the same leather pants for? Oh no, they weren't leather pants in the first one. They were just black, weren't they? No, it was a black skirt. It was a black skirt. Oh jeez. <laughs> Yeah, wow. anyway, so how many listeners have we got? There's a lot of people that well, don't Well, we just know lost me. a few. But <laughs> <laughs> but my deep, dark secret is out on the airwaves. Oh anyway, um, I now know that that is a symptom. I've recognized that. when, And, and <laughs> well I actually done. know a few. Yeah, I know a few people. An old boyfriend's mother I know had this problem. And I now know, like... I, with where her house is and the way it's situated, that's exactly what's going on. Um, so this is something you might not think is related to mold exposure, but I can tell you that it is. <clears throat> anyway, I feel like we should end on that note. 
I feel like we should. I don't. I don't think there's any way up from here, really. Here we go. <laughs> I love. I love that story, and maybe that's one to add to the pre-consult questionnaire. Like, mm. have you mm. shat yourself as an adult? I don't know how honest <laughs> people would be. I really, Lise has given me many things to think about, as with all of our listeners. And the one thing I wanted to wrap up with that I do feel like is important is, although Amy has shat herself in the past, she is, it does not take away from her very skilled experience and intelligence in this area. And I want to remind everyone again that um, you do have a course coming up soon. Can you just quickly um, <laughs> remind people where to find that, more information about it if they want to join? <laughs> oh, my God. If you weren't motivated to do this course before this <laughs> conversation, you might, I think you might be now. Okay, I'll try, and, I'll try and collect myself. I still can't believe I just shared that on, like, a public airwave. Anyway, <clears throat> If you would like to avoid being impacted by mould in any way, shape or form, including that, I am creating, and well, by the time this comes out, it'll be almost finished or it might actually be ready, a course called Mould Proof Your Home. And it's so that you and your partner and your family and the people you love can avoid having their health jeopardized by being exposed to a water damaged building or inadvertently trying to fix one up in a way that's actually quite dangerous and unsafe. So in the course, I'm going to go through the health effects of what mold does. FYI, I don't actually talk about losing control of your bowels and that. So I might have to add that. It's a podcast um, exclusive, friends. <laughs> Yeah, it actually really is. It was not planned. <laughs> anyway, if you are having health problems from mold, there's going to be a literature database there for you to be able to connect the dots and maybe have conversations with your own clinician about that and, you know, educating them. This is all about empowering people and illuminating what's going on. Um, there's also a module in there on how to prevent it. You know, prevention's always better than a cure. Mm -hmm. There are lots of things we can do to support the microbiome of our home, just like we support the microbiome of our gut. And in doing so, we can reduce the risk dramatically of ending up with a mold problem wherever we're, we're living and working for that matter. And then there's a section in there that details what constitutes appropriate medically safe and medically sound remediation practices. Um, there's resources in there on how to connect with appropriate building assessors, remediators, clinicians um, that can support you. And probably my favorite thing in there is I've got a training that helps you know what to look for when you're looking for your next home. So there's one in there for if you're looking for a rental. Obviously, if you're looking for a rental what you can, the investigations you can do are a bit limited. Um, if you're looking to purchase something though, there's a few extra things you can do because when you're going to hand over that chunk of cash, you can get away with. And mm. essentially it's a really nice way of educating people to avoid things that if you don't know that they're an indication of water damage aren't obvious, but once you do, you can't unsee it or unknow it. Um, and that means, you know, even if right now where you're living isn't the greatest, next time you'll know what to avoid, what to look for um, in the hopes of having a healthier home next time. Mm, I love that. And we will make sure all the links are in the show notes, but also make sure that you are following on in terms of social media, because I'm sure you will share there as well. Um, and I cannot wait to go through that course. I did your EMF proof your home course and found it so beneficial. And I'm a big fan of prevention because I just mm. think you really save a lot of time and money and effort by knowing what to look out for and how to prevent it rather than trying to scramble once you're already up shit creek without a paddle. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. <laughs> I almost want to share the photo. Okay, so the date that this comes out <clears throat> for the for the diehard fans that have made it to this <laughs> and didn't vomit in their mouth when I shared that story, I'm actually going to post a photo on the day that this comes out of me standing outside the Four Pines in those pants, okay? I am so ready for this. 
I'm not going to tell anyone on Instagram what that what the relevance of that photo is. I'm just going to put if you know, you know. Yes. Manly four pints, I'll tag them and it'll be <laughs> it'll be our little secret, okay? It'll be our little secret. <laughs> and and I'm going to and I'm going to call on all the people who are listening to this podcast if they see that photo posted and you huh? know the story, you have to yeah. hashtag in the comments, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, screenshot it, tag us. Yeah. Have a good laugh at my expense, please oh, do. <laughs> I love that. Well, we will see you all next time. Thanks for listening. And I think that's it from us. Thanks, Amy. Mm-hmm. Bye for now.